Welcome to the Organizational Pill, Additional Materials. Episode A1. Always great knowledge for change consultants who want to influence the world. Created by Eric R. Buhler, author of the best-selling book, Leading Exponential Change. Today, Claudia Patricia Salas and Eric R. Buhler talk about the brain during change, enterprise agility, and new techniques to increase resilience. Well, hello everyone. Uh, nice to greet you all. We see lots of people from, from different countries. Uh, this is going to be really, really, really exciting. Uh, well, I'm Claudia Salas. Um, I'm here connected in Madrid. And well, I do work with organizations, helping them to transform and become more conscious and more agile. And well, I'm here connected with Eric, who is located in Thailand. Hi, Eric. Yeah, hello. How are you doing? Yeah. Great, great. Um, well, today, guys, um, our goal is, gonna to, is going to be to share you some knowledge, but also some very specific techniques that you can use to manage uh, changes when it has to do well with environments as we are right now with, in times of COVID-19. Uh, so we hope you enjoy it. Uh, we're going to be presenting for about 50 minutes, and we're going to let some 10 minutes at the end for some questions. If you have some questions uh, during, well, while we present, uh, feel free to please post them in the chat and we will select a few questions in the end and well I think that's it let's then um, let's go let's go for it right so during this 50 minutes guys we want to share with you all the techniques everything we have learned with different clients around the world and many many important techniques uh, we are going to also explain how the brain works and differences between uh, what happened a few months ago that altered the way that uh, our brain works and we also wanted to recommend what we have been doing uh, since COVID started in companies and this is um, very important. But uh, before we start, we wanted just to make sure everyone is on the same page. This webinar is about resilience and uh, business agility, something I talk in my book, uh, Leading Exponential Change. And then from the psychology part or point of view, um, when we are talking about resilience, we are talking about the process of adaptation in the face of adversity, when you have a trauma, tragedy, threat, or other sources of great stress. Now, when we talk about companies, this is relatively similar. We have this kind of emotional um, resilience, but we also have social resilience, which is how the teams and people around you support you uh, when we have to overcome uh, hard times and also we have procedural resilience that is how the processes in the company are going to support you again when you have uh, to overcome these hard times like such, such as for example COVID. Now when we are talking about extreme business agility well, what ha we have seen is that companies generally have a horizon of one or two weeks or three weeks uh, it depends on which uh, framework they are using to adapt yes yeah? so they basically they are doing something and two weeks or three weeks after they change the goals and what we want um, here is show you different techniques where companies are going to be able to adapt even faster we know now that companies can change from one minute to another uh, or one hour to another or one day to another things can change and can be different and basically um, we want to share with you our experience uh, we want to share with you what happened in context changes the promise changes and then how to deal with that right and this is one very very important thing but before we want you to help us trying to know your opinion so Claudia all yours yes yeah so please join uh, menti.com with this code 798429. Okay, let's write it down here in the chat in menti.com. Okay, with this code. And please let us know uh, how, uh, what impact does COVID 19 have compared to other recent events? Yeah, I'm sharing here exactly the code in the chat where you can copy and paste it. And we can see here our options none, some, a lot, uh, very difficult times I'm having right now. And number five is I don't know how my business is still running. Zero for none, number one for some. We have number, yeah, a lot, very difficult times. 
I don't know how my business is still running. Let's see, how does this go? Have some people voting yet? Yeah, we start to get a lot, a lot of a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> Another one for a lot, another vote, another, yeah. Oh, no votes for none. This is interesting, right? Another for a lot. Okay, so um, let's try to focus a little bit more on this result of what that means for us. So if you take a look at pandemics in context, you will see that every probably 20 to 25 years, uh, we have a different pandemic. In fact, uh, when we are talking about pandemics, uh, you can see that we have the uh, Asian flu, for example, one million dead. Uh, we are talking about 400,000 at the moment. Uh, we also have, for example, um, other pandemics like the Spanish flu beginning of the last century, uh, where we have between 30 to 50 million deaths. So this is something that happens every 20 or 25 years. We have approximately uh, five pandemics. And my father always said that we, try, we generally remember one generation back, perhaps 50, 30, 80 years, unless you are a historian, then you don't, you can't see more than a hundred years um, back. But this is something that happens. And then we have other tools at the moment, such as artificial intelligence, we have internet, we have, uh, uh, short work cycles in companies, new techniques. So uh, we're going to see that even that happened before we have many more techniques than before, right? What do you think about this, Claudia? Yes, yes I'm seeing here also Jim is writing down some more pandemics. Uh, yeah, there's lots of more than the ones that we're just posting here. Uh, for example, there's the Russian spread. Uh, it had about 175 million deaths. Um, so our message here is that this is something that is not new for humanity. Our ancestors have lived this. And the good news is that right now, uh, thanks uh, to technology, we definitely do have a different mindset also that will help us to, in this case, well, manage and behave differently in this, in this pandemic. Yes, and then uh, let me tell you what happened during COVID. And this is something very important. Normally when a company had a bad time where well, we refer that to for example some market disruption for example you were just about releasing a product and then another company released a better product but what we have seen here is that people have to change their private private lives have to change their habits uh, they have to break their routine not just inside the company but also in their private life with the time with you know in the family uh, we have experienced increase uh, of uh, stress an impact on mental health. We should also agree that human beings are social beings. We need to connect with other people. Then also we can see that what we call ataraxia, that this, um, when people are isolated or at home for a long time, uh, our brain uh, get like kind of a state of mental tranquility. So you work from home, you get some stress, but you don't have to travel there. You don't have to drive your car. Uh, so we are exposed to different kind of stress. So at the time of going back to the company, it's a very, very hard time for you because you got used to staying at home. You got used to less stress or different stress. And then we started into this ataraxia when your brain gets used to that. So one of the suggestions for companies here is that do not try to start from one day to another from for example Monday people have to be in the office perhaps we need to do it like in different stages right um, we also have uh, possible changes uh, at the workplace right yeah that oh yes and this possible changes at the workplace maybe you're working less hours or maybe you're enrolling right now in a different project you were before or maybe you're not even working at all it's also interesting and, and there's lots of people who are overperforming and, and this is kind of interesting because you know overperforming is seen as seen as something that's positive it's like wow you have this amazing performance but people are doing this to secure their jobs and that creates sure. and lots of stress and then we have people with fear of unknown right where we can that can bring like kind of conscious and unconscious mental thoughts and negative mental thoughts or you know or any other emotional aspects 
um, you know, our emotion can swing from one side to another. Uh, we know today that perhaps uh, we have a curfew for several hours and tomorrow is going to be less and then we are happy, but then we are sad again. And then we have, um, you know, uh, we can have any alterations of problems in physical health. Uh, it's not going to be the same person we're going to see later. It's not the same person that left the company three or four months ago, that the new person, it's like a new person who's going to join the company and we're going to see how the brain works and which techniques we can use. Yeah, definitely we're not going to be the same anymore. And it's about not only has we see the economical environment is changing, it's also about the social environment. So what we're going to see now, we well, we do see here, for example, uh, some uh, job losses, right, in different sectors. Uh, some are very obvious, like maybe everything that what has to do with fun and, and retail, for example. But it's interesting to point some uh, you know, for example, some industries like the government that uh, usually are very steady and are having uh, disruptive changes. But has the good news, uh, not everything is about job losses. Uh, we're going to see some companies are definitely hiring lots of people. Um, they're definitely transforming themselves. And this is the most important thing. We know that well. changes are very deep right now and the social and economical structure. So let's see how can we get stronger right and live this resilience in our organization yes. yes and and i think it's very important to be very creative in these times i also remember a client in new zealand long long time ago that they wanted to reduce the number of employees in the company and uh, there was no any any other way and we started working with that company we discovered that one of the most of the the, the highest um, expenses for the company was the sub department that was around one million dollar a month and then we discovered that people were doing a lot of multitasking and probably you know that from the, when you are doing multitasking you are losing a lot of uh, business value um, uh, from moving from one task to another and we saw that for example the average uh, of uh, each employee uh, were doing at least four different uh, non-related tasks at the same time um, we were able to cross those information with some pieces of research uh, done by many companies and we saw that approximately 58 cents of one dollar invested in the company was lost uh, as a result of this multitasking so we work hard with this company to create the backlogs to reduce multitasking to make sure that people were able to focus to try to target this problem and this company did not need to to fire any single person so when we are talking about um solutions guys you need to be very creative sometimes the options you already got uh, are not enough and this is one of the important thing when we are talking about trying to re rediscover today we're going to talk about many many different options but i believe that you have many more than the ones that you experienced before right let me try guys to show you first um i want to talk about how the brain works the person who left the company three months ago is not the same person that is rejoining the company and you're gonna see why. So many of the techniques you were using uh, in Agile, Scrum, or any framework where you expected people to adapt to change are not gonna work very well. But then let me try to explain to you how the brain works very quickly and easy, uh, and then you will understand what is happening with the people that's gonna join the company or rejoin the company in the next couple of weeks, right? So at the front of the, the brain, you have your thinking brain, which is a prefrontal cortex. So every time you try to um, do some analytical reasoning or or perspective or anything very advanced, you use the front of your head, uh, the front of the brain, which is a thinking brain. In general, when you are trying to learn something new, you use the front of the brain. It uses a lot of oxygen and, and makes a lot of effort to try to understand and learn what, what's happening there, right? So that's why when you try to do a new task, or you join a new company, you feel very tired because the prefrontal cortex is trying to learn these new routines or these new processes or new habits, and then it uses a lot of oxygen. 
as soon as the prefrontal cortex understands how it works, it moves this information, automates this information, and moves it to the basal ganglia, which is at the back, which is what we call the heart drive of your brain. And that part, the basal ganglia, can do many things without consuming much oxygen. For example, perhaps the first time you started driving your car, it was very hard for you, you were very tired. Now you are on the phone, uh, listening to the music and driving the car, right? This is because that was stored in the basal ganglia, in the hard drive, and then um, it does not consume uh, much oxygen. Repetitive actions are what uh, the basal ganglia generally stores. But I wanted to focus in the center, we have the amygdala, which is what we call the fire detector. And this stores some emotional memories. And basically what happened here is that when there is a change in status, or you have a situation which is very dangerous, or uh, if things are changing quite quickly, or you have to face, for example, um, high uncertainty or an excessive change in, or in workload, for example, um, then what's going to happen here is the amygdala is going to activate very aggressively and it's going to release a lot of oxytocin in your brain. So what happened here is that it, that's going to basically disable the front of your brain and you start thinking like, let's say, a monkey. So this disables the higher brain centers and disable the thinking brain, the rational brain, and shut down the perspective and analytical reasoning and produce a stress response, like fear and anxiety, increases level of cortisol, and you start thinking in a different way. So when we are exposed to a lot of stress, we generally have higher levels of oxytocin and cortisol in the brain, which um, basically start disconnecting the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex is very important when we want to learn something new but also when we want to change so what happened is that people have been exposed for the last three months to a lot of stress so we can expect that in the next few weeks people um, coming back to the company are going to have higher levels of stress higher levels of oxy oxytocin and we have a lot of research which says that when you have a person who have um, a high uh, activation of the amygdala, this person is less, less flexible to change. So what's going to happen is people coming back to the office are not going to be as flexible as before, right? But let's, um, let me show you something. Uh, Claudia is going to comment you a little story for you to understand how the amygdala works and how it can influence what people are thinking. Yeah. I do think this is really interesting because this uh, goes against the common sense, right? We're usually saying like, we're gonna get stronger with COVID-19, uh, you know, like, oh, we're gonna be so much better. Um, but this is a kind of different message, right? Uh, the truth is that our brain is gonna be acting, uh, being more resistant uh, than being more adaptive. So to, yeah, to see this in a story- have more stress than before, right? Yeah, so to see this well in a story, we're going to present you here um, Anna and Fivo. Fivo is this little guy here with the t-shirt and the number five. So they work together and Fivo tells Anna, Anna, I have an idea I want to share with you. So she says, oh, Fivo always has good ideas. I'm sure I'll say yes, because well, they know a lot each other and they have lots of time working together. And he says, what if we flatten out the hierarchies to be more agile? What do you think Anna's response is? What happens to yes. Anna? So, <laughs> imagine that suddenly, guys, you wanted all the bosses in the company to create a more flat track to make it uh, more flexible, right? So FIBO read somewhere in some magazine that if you reduce the number of bosses and you, people start self-organizing, then everything's going to be great. So. And, and this is uh, something I'm going to show you now, guys. It works. I've been working in the five continents, and this is the same, no matter the culture. So what happened first here is that when Anna receives uh, this message, flattening hierarchies, then um, for the amygdala, uh, it, it sounds like a drop in prestige. So we are losing prestige. Before we were a boss and now we're going to be part of whoever, you know, whatever it's going to be. And then um, this is one of the most aggressive situations for the amygdala where they produce a lot of oxytocin. 
So what's happening here is that, first of all, and this um, was finally um, confirmed by uh, a research in Madrid by Antonio Gil in 2016, um, to 110 milliseconds, the amygdala kidnaps the thinking brain as this change does not support st status or job uh, security, right? And then uh, what's going to happen after is that um, the non-thinking brain and the amygdala is going to start influencing on a thought. It's going to start saying, hey, Anna, perhaps, you know, if the, this is going to be flat and you are not the boss anymore, perhaps you are going to lose your job. Perhaps you are going to um, not find another job. So start influencing that. And then the, this all new, new negative thoughts are now added to this, this story, this tale that Anna has. The problem here is that um, just at 220 milliseconds, the thought become conscious for Anna. So the thinking brain gets the new scenery without Anna being aware that she has been strong influence. And when that happened, when there's an activation, very aggressive activation of the amygdala, uh, we have seen that we have less adaptation to change and re less resilience, like this capacity to overcome uh, the hard times, right? Uh, so what we are going to see is that people going back to the office, they already have so many issues, changing routine, etc. So generally are going to be prone to an activation of the amygdala and they're going to be uh, less flexible to change. And today we wanted to show you guys how we can do uh, in order to uh, support all these people. Yeah. Claudia, yes, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, we, we really want to know more about this because knowing that people are going to be more uh, resistant than before, uh, uh, we, we start to lose our faith. So let's see what can we do. <laughs> okay, great. So let, let me talk first about a traditional company, how a traditional company works, how, what the beliefs are, and then we try to develop that into the new technique, right? So uh, imagine a traditional company have um, the base, uh, how they make money in four quadrants. The first one is increased revenue, that is, uh, you know, increasing sales to new or existing customer, the lighting or disrupting to increase market share, etc. Um, they basically try to increase this revenue for the company. So whatever you do, this is the first quadrant for a company. It's the first thing that any company does. The second quadrant that we generally see is protect revenue. That basically we, we are doing here, we're doing improvement and incremental innovation to try to sustain the uh, current market share and the revenue figures. Uh, we always try to protect revenue and then this is something that companies are already know is some traditional company, right? Then the, the third quadrant is about um, avoid cost, which is some improvement in the company to try to uh, sustain the, the current cost base. So co cost that uh, you are not incurring here, but may do in the future. And this is a very, very important point. And finally, uh, the fourth one is the typical reduced cost. You have the company and you say, okay, for, well, from tomorrow, uh, we're gonna reduce the number of employees and we're gonna reduce cost doing this and save some money. In here, the typical focus on traditional companies to reduce uh, costs is generally reduce resources of people. In Agile or with new ways of working, we are very careful as sometimes firing people, you also um, destroy the knowledge that, that people created. Sometimes uh, companies just take a look at the numbers and they fire team, but they don't have into mind that those teams created a lot of knowledge. So when we are talking about agile mindset and, and ways of, new ways of working, we make sure that uh, we do not, uh, we look carefully and, not, and strategically and not destroying this knowledge. But I wanted to talk about uh, what's my definition in a little exponential change about what business agility is. And for me, business agility is a capacity for the company to constantly adapt to market conditions to try to create the, a competitive advantage. But the key in the definition is what you can see in, in, in green here. And it says without negatively impacting on organizational health. And this is something very, very, very important. So we start trying to create or make these decisions. Uh, in fact, we work all around the world with different uh, companies and product owners, and we ask them to make decisions in this quadrant to locate 
any feature for any product or any decision they want to make in which part of this quadrant and make sure that it has high organizational health. But what is organizational health, Claudia? Well, organizational health is defined by, first of all, having some psychological safety plus the creation of sustainable value and perpetuity. What does this mean? Well, psychological safety has to do well with that, that feeling of being comfortable with being your true self. Uh, it's literally when you can think out loud and speak out your mind and the organization. And this, uh, we, did, we do need to create a system where people feel safe. But of course, you need to have this also sustainable value creation. Um, having an organization where people feel, you know, great, um, but there's no creation of value doesn't make that sense. But having an organization that only uh, creates value and there's no um, psychological safety, it's definitely not creating organizational health. Uh, so this is a must. Doesn't matter what strategy we use, we need to increase organizational health. Always. With a good organization, I help people are less receptive to change. They don't feel safe in the company. They stop talking to other people. So when the people do not feel safe, then this knowledge uh, stop flowing through the company, and we start getting yeah. less innovation, produce less business value. Um, yeah, it affects it. collective intelligence. Effect. Yeah, uh, this is about collective intelligence. You can have really, really smart people that are really skilled and they're really capable. But without um, organizational help in general, well, it, it doesn't matter that you have these fantastic people in your, in your company if they can't share and, and they can't create value as a collective. Yes, and one of the things we generally see is uh, when we take a look, imagine you join in the, or you step into a company and what I generally see is that, for example, where you have poor organizational health, leaders generally think of guilt so they just go and blame teams because of something is happening and when you have great organizational health they, they try to replace this guilt by curiosity just go and talk to teams where you have good organizational health uh, teams members trust each other um, and also something very important teams use conflict as a positive tool to learn and this is key for uh, the social resilience, right? The more we learn about conflict, the more we are able to, as a team, overcome those hard times. Yeah, so here we can see specifically, right? Some things that uh, decrease organizational health. For example, we have, well, uh, when, when failure is punished, for example, or too many strict rules. Um, right now with COVID, we can see lots of these things that are going on. So even if you're creating value or your business is still, uh, you know, um, adapting to the environment, well, we need to definitely avoid uh, the ones that are here on the left side. Or the other side, we have, for example, um, when conflicts are used as a positive tool, for example, or when you have that minimal change in people's private lives. And these are, well, just some things that are related uh, to behaviors or that we can find to create this organization help to increase it and always avoid decreasing it. Other thing you added, the minimal change in people's private life is, is, is key, right? If people do not feel stressed, they, they don't have to take work uh, at home. They, they can try to make compatible like private life with the company life, then uh, that's good place generally to work. Yeah. Let me show you something, guys. This is um, some, a model that Claudia is going to introduce that is part of Lean Exponential Change. I created this model uh, when I was working in, in Asia with a bank and they wanted to expand agility from just the IT area to the rest of the organization. Um, and is, I think it's a key framework for you to start understanding how to make a more flexible organization. So, Claudia, all yours. Yes, well, in this cake, because it's lit literally a cake, we can see many layers, right? Uh, we do see a first one is related to mental agility. So it's the ability to reframe our problems. It's related to individuals. For example, when we hire, it is important if we're looking to change organization to look for people who have who have this mental agility. And also when we work with cer certain leaders, 
it's also important to increase this mental agility. It's totally related to, to individuals. And can yeah, which is what we call yeah. neuroplasticity, right? Yes. And then we generally work with leaders from organizations with techniques like Robinson Crusoe or perceptual positioning techniques that uh, try to teach people how to increase their mental agility, uh, what, what, which is what we call uh, neuroplasticity, how your neurons connect. Yes, and the chat, um, Sudha wrote, it is so hard to convince management or leadership. So this kind of um, agility is related specifically to, to this kind of issues that we can find organizations. But beyond individuals, we do need some social agility. And it's how people relate. But not only relate to each other, it's about um, being adaptable to your clients. It also has to do with things and not working in silos, for example. Everything that has to do with the physical or virtual environment is also part of the social agility. Then we have the outcomes agility, and it has to do with, with the company's results itself, how we create products, how we compete in the market, uh, if we have a new strategy, um, how do we adapt to the market when, when it changes are occurring, right? And then next we have the structural agility. So it is related to lean processes, the collective creation of processes, roles, and total compensation. Uh, some areas, for example, like HR or finances have a lot to do uh, with this structural agility. And for last, we have, well, here we see the technical agility, which is related to Scrum, DevOps, testing, uh, having a better project management, being more effective. Uh, what happens here has any cake, you need to eat it as a whole, right? Uh, you just can't eat the chocolate that's on top. And that's what sometimes we do, right? We do get some technical agility. You can have this very big company where everyone is working with Scrum and they do have some, some benefits about this. But if you don't have these other layers, you won't have the business agility itself and uh, having a company that can adapt to what's happening right now. So here it's important that whatever you do or you plan inside your companies, you think about this uh, practices of how can they impact these five levels of business agility and not just focusing in, in one. Yeah, and I think it's very important when you consider making any change in the company. For example, we work with uh, CEOs of companies trying to increase uh, neuroplasticity, uh, trying to make sure that they have the right physical environment, trying to make sure people feel comfortable if uh, the strategy changed from one day to another. The company yesterday produced uh, shoes and now they have to produce something else. Then uh, do we have the uh, um, structural agility? Uh, the process is supporting, are we involving the people that uh, we, is going to be affected? Because people who is going to be affected generally is going to have a higher um, um, activation of the amygdala. If we integrate them, for example, we want to change the roles and we integrate those people, then um, it's going to be easier for them to adapt, right? And lower in, in activation of the amygdala and finally uh, technical agility. So we are looking to work on these five areas if we want to go to extreme uh, business agility, which means also that when you work on these five areas at the same time, you generally have um, the capacity to overcome hard time because you, you are working in a comprehensive way in the organization and not in an isolated way. And um, this is a very good model that you can use in any organization to start expanding the agility, not just to one area of the organization, but to all the areas. Um, what we're going to do now, guys, is uh, we basically gave, uh, gave you the, the foundations for uh, how to make a change in the company, what business agility, resilience, how the brain works. And we wanted to show you what we have been experimenting with companies. And uh, we want to show you some specific techniques that you're going to be able to use in your organizations to adapt faster, but also in an environment where people can feel safe. Yeah. And then we are going to recommend three techniques today or tactics today that I hope you can use in the company, your company in the next uh, couple of weeks. So the first recommendation is what we call strengthening the community. So all yours, Claudia. Yeah, first of all, we do have a hybrid situation. What does this mean? Well, uh, right now we have people who are working virtually, 
people who are working physically in their workplace and there's a mix that it's definitely different from what we had three or four months ago. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a hundred percent or virtual right now, uh, it, it is different. This is for sure uh, what's happening. So we do have this hybrid situation. And what we do need to start to do is to rebuild the social environment. Um, how does this work? We first need to understand that we people, um, we live through different social roles. Uh, for example, maybe you're an agile coach in our organization, but besides that, you have different roles. Maybe you're a mom, maybe you're a best friend of someone, uh, maybe you're active in, a, uh, I don't know, in your community. You also have a role as a neighbor, or even when you go shopping, you're a shopper. So what's happening right now is that um, we're living mostly all of our roles in the same place, especially with people who are working virtually. Um, so the brain really needs to have different uh, spaces for its different roles. So it's good to trick the brain, uh, for example, and this, this tip goes especially for uh, people who are working a lot virtually. Uh, if you use Zoom, maybe you're using Zoom for your family, to speak with your best friend and then to speak with your boss. And then you use the same computer to put some videos to exercise. Um, here the recommendation is to trick your brain. Uh, if you're using, for example, Zoom has a platform with your, uh, for your job, switch platform to communicate with your family, for example. This kind of things, even if they seem very, you know, like uh, irrelevant for our brain, it's like changing environment and that's really fantastic. It has really good effects and you can do the same if you're in a physical environment. Uh, this also has some, some changes and implications because of measures right now, uh, the workplace physically is not going to be the same. So we need to rebuild this environment. Important to understand here that uh, Zoom and Skype are uh, tools to use to have a one-to-one -one, one -one conversation, but in organizations, in, in companies, we really need more and we're going to explain uh, to you what you need to rebuild. What does it mean to rebuild the social environment? Yes, to effectively perform our, our different roles and feel more comfortable. So in the first place, uh, we do need to have some, some public information radiators. Uh, we need to make things visible. Um, even if we're working virtually, well, we will have to communicate and use certain platforms or, or tools for it, or if we're working um, in a physical environment. But it has to do with important information that's going on, people must know. This has a lot to do with transparency. Um, we're still deciding things like backdoors, right? And then we communicate. No, let's communicate, let's make it visible. In the second place, we need to have visible social interactions. Let's see, people, we need to see what other people are doing. Uh, and this is kind of interesting but because that's how a workplace works, uh, right? If you're in a restaurant, you see what other, uh, you know, uh, what they're doing, everything. If you're in an office, it's the same. And we do need to recreate this. Yeah, we need to see how people are moving, right? Uh, so when people yeah. are going, everyone is going to a meeting and then you see everyone is going, so I want to go there. So we need to make sure that uh, we recreate these social interactions, even if yeah. you are remote you have to have this information and we're going to tell you how right now, right? Yes. And as a third point, we need to recognize um, the visible facial expressions. Um, it is important in this case, of course, we're using platforms as Zoom for, uh, for uh, communicate and to see people's faces, but we don't need to overuse them. Uh, we just need to use them for conversations that really are to reflect, to create value and to make important decisions. Uh, because if not, you can have here some Zoom fatigue, which are there's lots of studies that support that this is something that, that's happening to people. And in the fourth place, we have the visualization of actions and movements for recognition and prediction. And we, the, for example, there's a platform and it's called Sokoko. Um, and it's used for, well, in this place here, you can see like a little picture of it. Uh, you have virtually uh, an office and you can see with avatars. Well, when people are in a meeting, you can see, for example, look, Anna and Fivo are talking in private. And then you can see Fivo moving around that he's going to talk with someone else in a virtual space. 
uh, which is kind of curious, but this makes us know when things are happening. If we see that people are meeting a lot in certain room, we know that something's going on there. That's why when we use Zoom, we have lots of fatigue and lots of problems because our brain is starting like to rebuild what's going on. And certain platforms, this so quick was just an example of platforms uh, that, that do provide this, um, help us to, to have this visualization. Yes, and I wanted to add here that, um, for example, in Sococo, uh, I was working with one client in Latin America where we have reproduced a, a physical environment, but also was a hybrid. So we have cameras, real cameras in, in, in different offices that were connected to virtual environments. So when someone moved the arrow, got into that room, then um, you could see that person in the room, but you could also see the participant virtually, and you could click on certain areas of the of that room to see uh, the information radiators or papers or whatever was in that room, right? And we were reproducing, rebuilding this social environment in in, in a virtual way in order to be a se the same experience. Uh, we didn't care if the person was where, where was or not there. Uh, the person had the same experience. And this is what we are looking for uh, with the rebuilding the social environment, yes. right? Uh, stop not using Zoom, virtually. use Skype. Yeah, but physically also, uh, we can see changes, for example, um, it's not going to be the same. Now, if you need to use a mask, you have a problem with the recognition of visible facial expressions, for example. Or if you need to keep up the two meters and, well, everything that has to do with the physical environment, if you're working in a workplace itself that is not virtual, you also need to apply it and we, it's our suggestion, this kind of, of principles and of practices. It will help you a lot. Yeah, and this is very important that uh, you also make sure that there is a connection between the value stream, how you produce value in the company and the physical space. If you need 30 people to produce a product, you, you could not have guys, the 30 products in two different floors, the boss at the top, the, 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 the other people at the bottom. So you have to make sure that you know how you create this product and then you have all the people in a way which is compatible with the way that um, you produce value, right? The connection between the value stream, how you produce this value and the physical and virtual space. And this is uh, very important. So the next point is what uh, we call improving communities of practice, which is basically um, we need to make sure now we have less people on board. Uh, we need to make sure the information flows into the company. Communities of practices are places where people go and can learn something. Some com companies can have communities of practice where, where, for example, architecture or software or marketing, and people go there to learn something new. But the key here is that in one of the companies in Latin America, which I basically recommended, is some of the communities of practice. First, everyone could go there, not just people dominating this topic. Uh, for example, a community of practice of software architects, uh, developers or product owners or everyone could go there. And then um, when architects, uh, software architects wanted to make a change, for example, change a platform, it has to be voted in the community of practice by everyone. So during the community of practice, these guys were trying to explain why they wanted to change this platform. And then people had to vote if they wanted to go in that direction or not. Imagine the architects, software architects, were trying all the time to convince people to sell the idea. And we saw massive improvement because the quality of the information improved as they wanted to convince people to come into these communities of practice of what is, uh, what, why we wanted to go in that direction. Or even people from marketing, community of practice from marketing. Uh, then we have people that perhaps uh, are not from marketing, but then these people need to understand. Anything else you want to add here? Claudia? No, um, for last and the last point. Yes. Where we have that we should have a daily skill balancing. And this is important. And we should create very something very simple where teams and people can say what skill are they missing, for example. And let's say. Yeah, what, that uh, can happen now, right? Perhaps I'm missing an accountant. I need, or I need board. someone who knows about design. For example, I do have a problem right now with marketing. I need help with this create an easy way to communicate this so people can exchange their skills. There are very yes. small practices that you can do about this. And it yes, and we, we have something, we have something called, um, uh, I explained that in my book, it's called farm market. 
when, for example, people from all the teams in the company put their CVs on a wall, and then if someone needed that skill, they took that CV and talked to that person and say, hey, how you can help us, for example, a team. Now, after COVID, plenty of people are not gonna be in the company, and perhaps, you know, they have to find the new ways, and teams have to be able to decide which skills they need we don't need a boss, a manager, just trying to find out where that person is, that the skill is. The own teams are responsible for their skills, right? So with the farm market, people took a CV from someone in a wall and say, oh, this one has the skill I need. And then I, they went and talked to that person to see if he was okay. So much more dynamic. Great. I think we can move on to the, to the next one. Yes. Yeah, so this is a key thing what we're going to recommend guys now. Um, this is what uh, we call establish a rapid response room. So what happened here is that things can change from one day to another, from one hour to an another. So we're gonna recommend that you establish in the company a rapid response room. And what is a rapid response room? So a rapid response room is a, a special room uh, which has information on everything is happening. Uh, some people call it war room and everyone can go into this room. The idea is to accelerate information flow of what is happening. And then everyone can go, this is very flat. People meet in that room. Uh, people start trying to see what's happening and start making decisions. So there are no hierarchies. For example, this is a rapid learning of the market, of estimation, what's happening, how long it's gonna take us, the new um, perspective or whatever is happening, disruption in the market. Then different profiles of, you know, people can be there, IT, marketing, finances, everyone can be meeting there. And then basically they're gonna decide what the changes are. They're gonna involve people, invite people who are affected by the change and we're gonna start making decisions. And what's gonna happen there is uh, they're gonna impact uh, teams working on products, it's gonna impact backlogs, it's gonna impact context, right? If the context changes, then uh, the promise, you promise something to someone and then that's going to change too. So perhaps you're going to need to review the promise, you're going to need to see the working agreements, uh, contracts, and then um, you're going to start generating new hypotheses to be tested on, 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 the, on the market, right? And try to try new alternatives. So if you have teams working in products using some framework like Scrum, we saw that they were using one or two weeks uh, sprint and releasing them perhaps is not valid anymore so they meet in this rapid response room and they started seeing that uh, things change and they make decisions they size the new work and they started working uh, on something new and then they refine and improve so the center of the new universe for this company is going to be this uh, rapid response room Claudia you want to add something here no, I think it's, it, it, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it must be very interesting to be in one of these and see what people talk about. So, about and the third recommendation yeah. we're going to give you guys is protect people and their emotions. We know that people are already passing through hard time. We know that people are less flexible to change. There's resilient, higher activation of the amygdala. Um, we saw what happened with these kind of people and we need to make sure that um, we people feel uh, comfortable and the first thing we're gonna see is that um we try to see is that people start connecting more with people and claudia has something to tell here guys yes um it is important um, to dedicate more time to people and see how they feel i mean uh, we do sometimes give people for granted like oh well they must be fine um but dedicating some time to ask even if you have a meeting for example or in a virtual meeting um, dedicate some minutes before the meeting to ask people how are they feeling and you can also practice some gemba and what has to do well with joining in the workplace with that person and being in contact with people this is this is highly important to create the psychological safety so leaders going down to the floor talking to people being curious trying to see what happens um, you know um, see yeah. how they can find not being in the office just 
trying to talk and talk and talk and find out and be curious once and again. And then other thing we wanted to recommend is what we call radical visibility, which is basically everyone knows what is happening. Everyone has the information. Over it. Do not overload people with the information. Remember, if the context changes, then um, your promise, your working agreements, everything can change. And we need to make sure that everyone also has a voice. Um, we are looking for leaders to reinforce every day, go and talk to people and reinforce the values. And one of the things I wanted to say that it's a very good time now to do is for uh, people to ask for feedback to the people below them, right? A boss going and asking people uh, below yeah. them, well, okay, what's happening? What can, can I improve? Um, uh, we want leaders to start connecting more reinforcing values every day, talking to values every day, making sure that uh, for people this uh, goals are realistic, the, the, the roles and execu execution plans are visible, they are un understood by everyone. Yeah. And specifically, uh, in, uh, what we want is just try to reinforce the purpose, why we are doing what we are doing and the, the, the leaders need to reinforce it all the time. Well, in many cases, we will see companies during this time specifically that they don't have a clear purpose. And this is really interesting. Maybe it is time to have one and to develop one and to have it very clear and to communicate it. Yes, and, and really remember that uh, when the context changes like COVID, then um, the promise can change. What you promise to your client can change. Your working agreement can change. What you were working three months ago, perhaps is not valid anymore. We are going to need to revisit all the backlog. Why we are doing this? How are we going to be able to sustain the company? We, should we go in different direction? If so, do we have enough mental agility? Do we work more things of this or not? And this is one of the things uh, we want to to work on, right? And, and we want to share guys with the, you the, 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 the framework, how this framework works. This is something that we are very transparent about sharing all this information with you. So the first thing is we're going to center the whole company in this rapid response uh, room. Everything can happen there. We have all the information. Everyone can go there, team meet there, and then they decide what to do, what changed, um, what's the new promise, what, what is affecting things. And we're going to try to deliver high quality value early and often right into the market to test if we are going in the right direction. What is important is that we are gonna, after we did that, we optimized the flow and to end, we were doing something that it took uh, 10 people and 10 days. Is there any way we can do that faster and optimize this flow? Then we're gonna have um, people or resources that are not available anymore. Can we replace them in a way that's gonna be unlimited? For example, can we use artificial intelligence? Can we automate it? what we can do. But the secret in this framework is that any decision we make has to have high organizational health. Yes. And this Great. is uh, what we are trying to recommend guys to use once and again in companies all around the world that wanted to face disruptions that perhaps are going to last for months and going to change faster and faster, right? And we're going to give you some, sometimes we have, if you have some questions, Claudia, we can. Yeah, um, we're right on the hour. And for those who have to disconnect, um, there's no problem. We, we're we're um, recording this and we're going to be sharing the link with the recording. Okay. Um, but we can, here we have a couple of questions and we're going to stay a couple of minutes more if you have some time. Um, we're to record a couple of questions, right? And to, and to share. Yes, you can put your questions on the chat yes. box. So, uh, I don't know if you're seeing them. Okay, um, no. here we have one. Um, it is related. Yep. It says, uh, Nama. Hi, Nama. She says, can you please elaborate on the response room? What are the basic rules for it as for participants? Agenda, do you recommend open space approach or a more managed facilitation? Uh, well, if you have a more open space approach, information is going to flow quicker than management approach. But it depends in, on it depends on the company, really. You have, as a consultant, you have to see which approach is going to work for that company. Perhaps that one approach is going to go very well in one company, but not in another. Uh, the objective is, at the end of the day, is first, you can make a decision as quickly as possible. Second, people are going to feel comfortable psychological health, uh, remember we talk about that, and good organizational health. 
people feel comfortable with the decisions and they are happy to go in that direction. Um, and then how you elaborate that, some company have a big space. Uh, I recommend not having chairs, people are standing, not having any table, but having all the walls with information. People even can use post-it with the news and they can write, they can use screens, they can use anything um, they believe it would provide information to make a better decision. Yes, and, if, right. and if you're working virtually, you can use some kind of platform, for example, Mural, uh, for example, just, uh, you have to test, of course, to see what goes with your culture and your case, uh, but something that where people can make visible what they're talking about. Uh, the rest is the tool, right? And how can you apply it or how can you do it? Yeah, try to see how we are going to do that with social interactions. The easy, the Try not to use tools. Okay, another question, Claudia. Yes, uh, Nama had another question also. She, uh, yeah. she asked about the case in New Zealand you had. How were you able to link loss of investment to multitasking? Okay, yes, yeah, so we have two basically uh, pieces of research. One was done by Microsoft during 10 years, and there is one more I cannot remember, but you will find on the internet um, where they basically uh, connected loss of investment with uh, multitasking. So um, you can take a look at very extensive pieces of research and you will find they are all the information, right? There are, there are a lot of information on multitasking and how much you lose when you work on one task, two tasks, three tasks, etc. And this is, uh, this is something we have a lot of companies, big companies who work on that before. Yes. Great. And here we have our last question of um, dialect. Uh, do I say this dialect? Sorry, I, I don't know where your name is from. and <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. He asks, what is your opinion for being anti-fragile? If we can become anti-fragile, we might start to adopt and learn from disorder, volatility and uncertainty instead of adapting VUCA with resilience. Well, uh, at the moment, um, I don't have any opinion, to be honest. I'm, I'm generally open to any framework. I think um, frameworks and ideas are just a mean to achieve a goal. And as long as it works for you, it works for the company and have high, uh, just, you know, impulse uh, uh, good organizational health, it is a good idea, right? I don't have any opinion with any of these uh, new mindsets, ways of working. I think any, anything can work. As long as you consider that at the end of the day, uh, anything you do is has to be sustainable. Yes, and those are were the questions we had. Then we have some people who said they created an, an Obeya room similar to this in my company. Good, so uh, yeah, some sharing about uh, the rapid room, uh, rapid response room um, that they created. Well, thanks a lot. Thank um, you very much. Hope no, thanks framework. very uh, much to everyone. Um, our invitation is that whatever you try, we'll start with something small and experiment and see what goes on, but always increase organizational health while you do this. Yeah, we are very happy. We have people from all around the world. I hope you recommend this recording. It's going to be available in a few days' time and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Claudia, for joining tonight. No, thanks to you, Eric. If you enjoyed it, share it with your network. In the meantime, it might be a good idea to grab a copy of Leading Exponential Change to go beyond Agile and Scrum. See you soon.